Good morning, I'm Steve Waldron and I work for Vector GB and welcome to my first presentation of the day as part of our WebLive 2020 event. This presentation I've titled Will Your Next Car Be a Smartphone on Wheels? And I'm going to explore a little bit about the next generation of software we expect to see in ECUs in cars of tomorrow. But before we look forward to tomorrow, let's take a quick look to the past and a small history lesson. Where did software all begin inside the car? Well, the first software was introduced in the very early 1980s. It was an engine control unit, an engine ECU from Bosch. And since those uh, 1980s, early days of the 1980s, we see many, many new ECUs coming into the vehicle with many, many new software features. If you go to conferences, you'll hear terms banded around of hundreds of lines of software or even millions of lines of software in the car. Uh, and of course, physically, we now have a large quantity of software inside the vehicle. And I would say around 80% of new automotive innovations are really based on software features, that the, uh, delivering software features to the driver. So software quantity and complexity is growing exponentially in the car. But what, what are the driving factors of that today? Well, today we talk about the so-called automotive megatrends. Megatrends are connected car. You perhaps have a smartphone app where you can log on to your car, adjust the air conditioning, adjust the temperature, lock or unlock the car, perhaps get a destination on your phone and send it into the car so it's already preloaded into the sat-nav, that's connected. Autonomous car, and we don't necessarily mean uh, fully autonomous driving, but perhaps just advanced driver assistance systems such as adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist system. Then we have the electrification of the vehicle. This means removal of the internal combustion engine and, and driving via electric or battery powered instead. And now with a culmination of all these three type of topics, connected, automated, electrified, there is a consideration in the, in, in the industry that we might not even own our own car anymore, that we might share a vehicle. So because a vehicle has to go off and charge for a large amount of time and the battery makes that vehicle much more expensive, then it might be that instead of owning our own car, we would uh, hail a car like we would hail a, an Uber, for example. That car turns up, we drive it to where it needs to go, and then either it goes off to service someone else or it goes off and it charges itself up. So that's a concept of shared driving. So these automotive megatrends are often acron given an acronym, uh, CASE or ACES, for example. And these are the driving factors driving more and more software inside the car today. Let's have a little bit of a look at the electronics that are used to support these uh, driver features that we want. So in the past, we used to talk about single electronic control systems, and that meant the transmission ECU, the engine controller, the braking ECU. Um, that's how we used to work in the past. But today we really have a very complicated ecosystem of ECUs and electronics inside the vehicle. Many, many ECUs, many different uh, networking technologies allowing communication between these ECUs. And today and in the future, we expect this to move outside of the car. Um, so this means vehicle to vehicle type of communications, even vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to traffic lights, for example. And this is what we broadly term V2X communications. When we look specifically at the ECUs and the networking inside the car used to power all these uh, type of features, then we've moved well beyond the handful of ECUs in the car to today where we can have 100 or perhaps even more than 100 ECUs inside the car. The networking technology has increased in capability. So from your traditional CAN buses to today, we have Flexray networks or even Ethernet networks inside the vehicle. And 10 years ago, I used to see many projects worried about moving from 16-bit controllers to 32-bit microcontrollers. Today, it's really uncommon to see a new ECU that's not based on a 32-bit microcontroller or perhaps even a couplet with a 64-bit micro inside. When we look specifically at the networking architecture, this diagram represents our, I would say, our traditional legacy-based network architecture design. We have single ECUs, the engine ECU, the door module, the ABS ECU, and these are all networked together with CAN or various different CAN buses. But traditionally, we've had 
one ECU implementing one specific software function at the driver level and one supplier supplying that one ECU, that one system to many um, different OEMs, as many OEMs as possible. And these ECUs will be supporting your traditional autos are basic software inside and they will be sharing really a rather constrained or limited amount of data between each other. So the data that each ECU sends and receives is predefined in something like a DBC file, for example. So this is our legacy type of architecture and this has evolved today. Uh, to a slightly more complicated design that we call a domain controller architecture or more specifically a functional domain controller architecture. These larger boxes in the diagram represent our domain controllers and this means powertrain domain controller, chassis domain controller, body domain controller and these functional domain controllers may be hosting a number of different functions I don't know maybe four five or six different functions themselves but also have dedicated ECUs underneath on a on a CAN bus so you may have your powertrain domain controller hosting some powertrain functions with a powertrain CAN behind a chassis domain controller hosting a few functions with the chassis CAN behind and then these domain controllers, functional domain controllers, communicating with each other um, with a high-speed network, perhaps Flexray or perhaps uh, an Ethernet backbone. And the, this, this type of architecture yields quite a complicated uh, network design and a complex gatewaying of signals. If you need to route a CAN message from one CAN bus beneath the powertrain bus onto the chassis bus, uh, at the other end, you now have a complicated uh, gatewaying of data signals uh, through the ECU, uh, through the ECUs. So, what what was put in place to manage this complicated networking and complicated software considerations was, of course, Autozar. So, the scope of Autozar was designed to standardise the basic software inside the ECUs, but also to help manage the complexity of the network communications and the distribution of software across these ECUs. So, so this, was the, this was the intent of Autozar. And of course, we want to keep putting more software features inside the car, but let's see how this is now evolving uh, in the future. Vehicle manufacturers don't want to keep putting more and more ECUs inside the car. Every time you add an ECU inside the car, it adds weight, it, it adds weight, it adds more wiring, it adds cost, it adds complexity. So in fact, instead of more ECUs, we want to actually move to less ECUs. Less ECUs, but bigger, more capable, more powerful ECUs hosting more software features inside. So perhaps 10 or 12 or even 15 software functions, features inside each large power ECU. Now, communication technology. Typically in the past, this has been rather static. Uh, something like a CAN DBC file or in, in Autos are an ARXML file. Let's imagine you now are a new piece of software. Let's take an example. You are an adaptive cruise control software. Your car supports cruise control and you want to download a new piece of software into that car, adaptive cruise control. And in order to work correctly, that adaptive cruise control, when it comes into the vehicle, needs to say, hey guys, I'm adaptive cruise control, I need the radar. Can anyone give me radar information, please? And the radar needs to respond and reply to that and say, yes, I'm the radar, here is your radar information. I can give you distance to the car in front. And the adaptive cruise control says, great, thanks, now I can fulfill my place in life. I can provide adaptive cruise control now that I have the radar information. The setup of that communication inside the vehicle is rather dynamic. Those messages never existed in the network before. Unlike our old CAN DBC files where all the messaging was defined at design time on a computer somewhere years before SOP. Now that type of communication and those messages are dynamically instantiated inside the vehicle and the protocol to support that is some IP this is service orientated middleware over Ethernet finally when we look to the processing power then actually we don't see so many 64-bit uh, microcontrollers microprocessor projects coming along but we do see a lot of multi-core projects and this means dual core 32-bit systems triple core 32-bit systems even a few quad-core or eight-core 32-bit uh, microcontrollers inside. So this is the enablers that we see coming into the vehicle to support these case use cases. Okay, 
Let's take a look at, at Autozire and what it promised us and what it delivered us. So Autozire today is used in many, many um, ECUs inside the car. So some OEMs might have 50% of their ECUs having Autozire basic software inside. Uh, a few OEMs have nearly 100% of their um, ECUs hosting Autozar software. But Autozar software is used to host many, many of the ECUs. So, for, for example, we have the body controllers, things like lighting control, seat control, for example, that has basic software inside. Um, then our instrument clusters, which have typically always needed to run something like a Linux or a POSIX operating system inside, uh, for the necessary graphics libraries to drive the instrument cluster. We'll also have a secondary microcontroller, which is often termed the vehicle-facing microcontroller, which sits on the CAN bus to handle all the real-time necessary stuff for sending messages onto the, onto the CAN bus for all the other ECUs. So there'll be autos our basic software inside the instrument cluster on a, on a supportive uh, microcontroller. And then we have ECUs that need to take into consideration functional safety requirements, so braking ECUs, um, stability control ECUs. So of course Autozar has provided us with me methods for functional safety for those uh, ISO 26262 uh, type of ECUs. And then finally we have ECUs with very hard real-time requirements, um, typically ECUs that need to run motor control like uh, like steering ECUs for example. So um, Autozar is, is designed to support those type of ECUs as well. So Autozar has brought us many, many, many benefits. It's helped standardize the software that's used not only at one OEM from basic to mid to high line type of vehicles, but also standard software across different OEMs. So many OEMs now are using the same type of basic software in all their ECUs. It's standardized the workflow across uh, the OEM and the supplier, and specifically I mean the data exchange format of the ARXML file used to exchange the ECU extract of system description. Autozar has certainly brought in many new features such as support for those new communication technologies like FlexRay and Ethernet, methods um, for functional safety such as ISO 262 freedom from interference mechanisms, and today, in the latest versions of the Autosar standards, we have features for cybersecurity, such as um, SecoC secure onboard communication with uh, authentication and freshness of messages. It's helped manage the complexity, and of course, we have a very, very complicated ecosystem of networking of controllers inside the, uh, inside the vehicle today, and Autosar has helped us manage that. It's helped improve reuse of software. We get much better reuse of the same basic software time and time again across ECUs. And it's definitely lowered like for like costs. So when we look at our Autozar CAN stack, if we compare it to Vector's previous uh, CAN incarnation, then, then the Autozar CAN stack is lower than, than our previous, the costs are lower than our previous um, CAN stack. But, of course, Autozar is not a silver bullet. It hasn't solved every single problem we have inside the car. There are definitely things that Autozar uh, hasn't done and, and things that it aimed to do, which it hasn't done. And specifically, I, I really mean this ability to drag and drop software inside the vehicle. So there was this Autozar dream that we could create an Autozar software component and we could put it into the car on any ECU that was hosting an RTE. We can drag and drop it. As long as there was an Autozar basic software inside with an RTE, we could drag and drop that software component on top of the RTE. And this, this really isn't the reality of, of what Autozar has delivered us. And, and of course, in order to enable these uh, connected, autonomous, electrified and shared concepts, we need this facility to be able to drag and drop software inside the car. We want our car to work like a smartphone. We want to be able to dynamically install and instantiate applications during runtime for a number of different features, for a number of different reasons. So, for example, we might need to update software. We might need to roll out bug fixes without doing a warranty recall. But also, there's commercial aspects behind. So, the OEM might want to have an app store where the customer can buy a basic car at a basic level of cost and then go onto the app store and purchase aftermarket upgrades like the um, adaptive cruise control. And so we need a new generation of Autozar software 
that enables us to really dynamically install and start applications during runtime, just like you would do on your smartphone. And this generation, this next generation of, of software is called AutoZar Adaptive or Adaptive AutoZar. And it's our next generation of, of basic software. Now, I often get asked, is Adaptive AutoZar a replacement to the existing AutoZar? And I'll address that question very, very quickly. So the answer simply is no. So Adaptive AutoZar is a new, completely different type of, um, of software inside the vehicle that's designed to complement the existing autos RECUs that are already there, already there in the vehicle. So there's a number of key differences uh, with autos R adaptive. So autos R adaptive is specifically designed for high power, high performance ECUs that are really looking to run applications for these future ADAS use cases for your, your high power autonomous driving type of software. The adaptive uh, stack of software doesn't run with uh, an RTOS uh, like the, or what's being now termed Autos R Classic would do. It runs with a POSIX operating system. This means something like embedded Linux or QNX, Green Hills Integrity or Pyke OS. So Microsoft Classic, what's been established for 10 years now, runs with its own operating system, its Autos R operating system. but Adaptive Autos R is designed to run with an existing POSIX operating system. Of course, Adaptive Autos R ECUs have to run cohesively with the existing Autos R Classic ECUs. Adaptive Autos R has to support safe and secure uh, software up to a level of rigor demanded by ISO 2626 level D. But most importantly, you have to have this ability to dynamically install and start applications during runtime. And that's a feature op offered by the POSIX operating systems. Let's see how we expect the electronic architecture to evolve inside the vehicle as a result of these new type of um, autos RECUs coming in. So I already mentioned the functional domain controllers, but what we see in the future is that we'll move beyond functional domain controllers in, in what's being termed as zonal domain controller architecture. And zonal domain controller architecture means that instead of having a, for example, powertrain domain controller, chassis domain controller, we will have a domain controller that is assigned to the uh, regional area of the car. So front left, front right, rear left, rear right, for example. And in this nature, um, the wiring harness becomes much more lean and much more efficient and, 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 and much more effective. The ECUs that are shown here on green will be sensor actuator ECUs. And, and this means they will be your traditional ECUs, things like your power steering unit, your ABS unit, your door module, that is still running your classic autos are. The ECUs shown here in blue will be your zonal domain controllers. And we expect that those also will still be using classic micros R for, for quite a while. But the big one in the middle, the red one shown here, is what's being called a central compute platform or central computing node. And this is your candidate for the adaptive autos R platform. So we really don't expect to see many of these inside the vehicle. One, two, three, perhaps a maximum of, of five or six of these central computing nodes. But these are really your target nodes for being able to dynamically load your applications on top after the production of the vehicle. So these are your candidates for adaptive autos R. Let's take a brief look at the major differences between Autos R Classic, what's now being termed Autos R Classic, and Autos R Adaptive. So Autos R Classic will still be around for a long time to come. It's really there to run your safety critical systems and specifically your systems there with the hard real time requirements, things like the motor control, for example. But your adaptive platform is there to give you the raw processing power needed to host those very demanding applications, um, those very demanding ADAS and autonomous driving type of applications. More specifically, um, in Autos R Classic, every module has been completely um, specified. 
you can go onto the Autozar website, you can have a look at all the specifications and you get pages and pages and pages of specifications where every module has been really rigorously defined even down to the very last variable. In Autozar Adaptive, there's really only an API specification with um, less rigor in the in the description of the module itself and the, and, and the actual functional behavior of the module itself is, is up to implementation dependent. In classic, uh, everything is developed in C, and more specifically, Misra C. But in adaptive, because we're designing to meet those ADAS type of applications, we need to have the ability to support an object-orientated language. We need to be able to uh, recognize objects on the road, objects like other cars or pedestrians or traffic cones. And each of those objects has uh, parameters uh, such as uh, distance away, velocity, um, acceleration and so we need an object orientated language and that means adaptive is um, uses C++ rather than C. Autozar Classic uses signal based communication and this means predefined in a communication metric specifically an ARXML file whereas Autozar Adaptive uses this new communication technology service orientated middleware over the Ethernet so it uses this client server based relationship for dynamically instantiating communication inside the network. In Autozar Classic, the configuration is built statically. This means we have a, a design tool like DaVinci Configurator and we predefine how all the inputs and the outputs work in the ECU. In Autozar Adaptive, this configuration is dynamic. It's loaded together with the application and it's loaded in something that we call a manifest file. And this also stands for the actual application itself. So in Classic, the application, together with the basic software and its configuration, is all statically compiled in one piece. We have all the hundreds of pieces of um, hundreds of C files, and we press compile, and we link one hex file, and that's the hex file that gets tested and gets rolled out into production on the ECU. In adaptive, the applications have started as POSIX processes. Uh, this has some underlying requirements underneath. For example, we need a memory management unit within the microprocessor, for example, but it allows us to dynamically install and start applications at runtime inside the ECU. And this is the key factor that Autozar Classic never, never really gave us. When we look specifically to the safety mechanisms in adaptive Autozar, those safety mechanisms are very similar to uh, the mechanisms we have in Autozar Classic. So we have the end-to-end -end protection for data protection, the appending of a CRC, the role encounter. We have a mechanism called platform health management, which is analogous to our watchdog manager in Autozar Classic. This provides us with a live monitoring and deadline monitoring of tasks and this uh, program flow monitoring that we have for the logical supervision to make sure tasks have run in the right order. And we have the check of persistency of data. And this means when we're storing data to flash, we can append CRCs to make sure that that data hasn't been corrupted in any way. So um, in adaptive, we see many similar mechanisms uh, for functional safety that we've had in classic. But something we also have to take into consideration is moving beyond our typical fail safe systems into fail operational. And I'm going to talk about that in my second presentation of the day a little bit later on. We have a brand new tool suite available now, and that's our DaVinci adaptive development environment. And um, you can see an example here, which allows you to develop your uh, applications. And I would say something that the adaptive platform gives you that, that, that we tried to offer with Classic, but, but we didn't really do very well, or Autozar didn't do really very well, is the, this real, real ability to develop applications independent of the hardware. So we will have a tool suite that will allow you to develop applications without genuinely on your PC in an emulated environment without any consideration of the hardware underneath. I, this is our roadmap for our adaptive platform, and I don't want to go into too much detail on here, but I'll pick out just a few of the key features. So our first eight, available today, we have QM um, adaptive basic software ready for production, and our first ASIL releases for selected use cases will become available towards the back end of this year. 
So those, that's our first ASIL releases. One other major feature um, that you might have noticed when I talked about my adaptive cruise control application and the fact that the radar has to dynamically set up messaging, if, if you were closely noticing, you, you might notice this need through the domain controllers to convert from your typical signal-based communication, predefined signal-based communication, to the service orientated middleware over Ethernet. And this is what we term signal to service communication. So, our signal to service communication, which will allow you to do that inside the network, will become available in quarter two next year. So, those are some of our key features. Uh, in our roadmap. We also have a live demo. So we have a live demo uh, that sets up a number of domain controllers and um, these domain controllers are running Microsoft Classic. And we also have, uh, you can see in the lower picture, a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is running Linux and that Linux stack has our adaptive autos, our software uh, alongside. And then um, you can, dine th this, the car is running cruise control. And you can now in this demo dynamically load in an adaptive cruise control application onto the Raspberry Pi with, with our adaptive Microsoft stack and watch the adaptive cruise control application start. And when you start that application up, then there's a small distance sensor at the front of the car. And as you move your hand forward and backwards from the distance sensor, it adjusts the wheel speed based on the distance sensor in front. So we have that demo all set up to see this really, really working. Um, and so if anyone wants to see that, please just let me know, either drop me an email or let me know at the end of this session. And we will set, set up a few webcams and you can see that live and running. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this talk about where I see the future going for embedded software inside the car. Um, to conclude, we have Autos R Classic. It's a mature and well-established solution. It meets many of the needs of the ECUs today inside the vehicle. Uh, it meets functional safety requirements using your typical mechanisms of memory protection, timing protection, and data protection. And it's a, a, a safe and secure solution. But for the future, we have Adaptive Autos R, and Adaptive Autos R is specifically designed as a next generation of basic software to meet those uh, use cases, those case aces use cases, connected driving, autonomous driving, shared driving, and electrification. Um, it supports some IP, uh, it uses C++, and specifically, really importantly, it supports the dynamic loading of new applications. And um, it also will contain functional safety mechanisms, not only for fail safe fault handling, but moving beyond that into fail operational handling. And if that, that interests you, please feel free to watch my, my subsequent presentation today on fail operational. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk and now I welcome any questions you might have.